Greek philosophers used to say that death is the beginning of wisdom. That's what makes you stop and think about life, think to examine your life. But just thinking about death on its own is not enough to give rise to wisdom. Some people have the attitude, well, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we may die, if that, as if that were the best way to spend your time. It takes more than just thinking about death, it's also thinking about your potential as a human being, your potential for happiness, and where that potential truly lies. As the Buddha pointed out, it is possible through your actions to find a true happiness. Your actions have a huge amount of power to determine the type of happiness and the type of pain that you meet with in life. And your choices do make a big difference. It's reflecting on this fact that gives rise to heedfulness. And it's actually the heedfulness that gives rise to wisdom, because you realize you have to be careful in what you do, say, and think. Because if you're careless, you can create a lot of trouble, both for yourself and for the people around you. And that heedfulness is the beginning of all skillful qualities, or it's the, the root of all skillful qualities, is because we're heedful about the potential dangers and the potential opportunities that are opened by our actions. That we develop good qualities of mind. We realize that this is a good use of our time. That even though we may not know what the future holds in store, if we've developed our powers of mind, powers of mindfulness, alertness, ardency, These skills, these powers, when we've developed them, will help us in any situation. That's one of the reasons why we're here, is to work on developing these powers. As you keep the breath in mind, you're developing mindfulness. As you're trying to be alert to what's actually happening with the breath, and alert to whether the mind is staying with the breath. That's the quality of alertness. It's the ardency, however, that actually develops these things. In other words, as soon as you notice that you've slipped off the breath, if you're ardent, you'll come right back. If you're not ardent, you'll just wander around and look at the flowers, look at the butterflies, and after all say, well, maybe I should get back to the breath. It's good that you get back, but the whole point is to get back more and more quickly, because it's in those gaps in your alertness that important things are going on in the mind. The mind does have this tendency to place a curtain over its workings. Like the wizard in The Wizard of Oz, who likes to hide behind the curtain as he manipulates the machinery. And once the curtain is stripped away, it destroys the illusion. And the mind likes to engage in illusions, builds thought worlds, and they don't really seem totally real unless you can close off your awareness of how the thought world was, bit, was built. And so it's in those gaps in alertness that the actual machinations are going on. So those are precisely the things you want to see. So as soon as you realize you slipped off the breath, come right back. And you'll learn several things. You'll learn how the mind slips off and what it's doing in the middle of the time when it's slipping off. You'll learn important lessons about the mind. Ardency also means that while you are with the breath, you try to be as sensitive as possible to how the breath is going in the different parts of the body. As you breathe in, where do you feel the energy flow? Can you sense any tension or tightness or blockage in the flow? If you do, what can you do about it? Sometimes just being alert to it is enough to 
disband any tension. Other times you have to work things through more carefully. And you try to develop the ardency that's willing to stick with it and be patient. If one approach doesn't work, you try another. If you can't go directly through the blockage, well, you try to circumvent it. Or if there's a pain in one part of the body and focusing on the pain or trying to bring the breath to the pain doesn't seem to help, bring the breath to the opposite side of the body. Or you may notice that some parts of the body are doing all the work in your breathing. And they're doing it for the sake of other parts of the body while they themselves feel starved. So give them a chance to breathe just for themselves. Say, let your shoulders do the breathing, but the breathing only has to go into the shoulders for the time being. See what that does. In other words, you use your ingenuity. This is an important part of ardency, that you, you don't give up when one approach doesn't work. You try new ones. And this way you develop your mindfulness, your alertness, your concentration. You develop your discernment. So you can bring them so that you can bring them not only to issues of the breath, but also to other issues in life as well. This is one of the advantages of getting the mind still like this and balanced in the present moment. It's in a more impartial space. You can drop your regular narratives for a while and just work on the, the processes of the mind. So that you can begin to notice when you start picking up other issues in life, like the issues that normally come when someone in the family dies or someone you know well dies. You can look at the issues, and you also can look at the mind as it's dealing with those issues, but you can look at it from a position of at least a little bit of detachment, so you can observe what's going on. When the mind is still and clear and balanced like this, it can ask itself questions, pose questions, and get a more balanced answer. There's no 100% guarantee that every answer that comes up in a quiet mind is going to be reliable. But it's more likely to be reliable than if the mind is just running around. When the mind is really still, it can face the questions that we don't usually like to ask make observations that we don't usually like to make, but are important. This is a passage where the Buddha recommends when somebody dies, you reflect on the fact that your body too has a similar fate. It hasn't gone beyond that fate. And you can do this either to gain a sense of detachment for the body or a sense of perspective on time. You don't know how much time you have. In other words, it's good for heedfulness. And you can ask yourself, when you yourself are going to have to face death, what skills are you going to bring with you? Because it is possible to die without suffering, but it requires strong mindfulness, strong alertness, and a good understanding. We're able to separate the mind from its objects, separate it from its feelings, perceptions, thought constructs. There's a famous passage where Ananda Bindika, who had long been a supporter of the Buddha, is on his deathbed. Sariputta and Ananda go to see him. And Sariputta says, Try to detach your consciousness from sights, from sounds, smells, tastes, tactile sensations. Detach it from the eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, mind. It goes through a long, long list. And you even detach your consciousness from the consciousness of these things. In other words, anything that come up as a, an object of your awareness, you try to let it go, let it go, let it go. And then the Mindika, even though he'd been supporting the Buddha for many years, had never stopped to listen to a Dharma talk like this. and started crying. And Nanda thought well, he was losing his grip. And Nanda Bendiga said, no, I'm not losing my grip. It's just that after all these years, I'm only now am I getting to hear this Dharma talk. 
So we asked Sariputta to tell the Buddha, please give this Dharma talk more often to lay people. The point being that the most important skill you can develop is that skill that's able to let go. Whatever appears in the mind that's causing any kind of weight or any kind of concern, you're able to let it go. This may sound irresponsible, but it's an important skill that you need to develop even as you negotiate the issues of everyday life. If you carry all your responsibilities around with you all the time, the mind is going to wear out. As John Fung used to say, it's goodness begins to break down if it tries to carry too much. And so when you have responsibilities, you have to learn how to put them down, even if it's only temporarily. But for the time during which you put them down, you want to be able to leave them alone and not anticipate that you're going to pick them up, just that while you're here, they're put down. This gives the mind a chance to rest and can stand up. You can think of it as those, the coolies who work on the ships in Bangkok, who carry these huge bags of rice and bags of other things on their backs as they go up and down the plank, off the ship and onto the shore, and off the shore back onto the ship. And because they spent so much time walking around with burdens on their backs, they tend to walk over, bend over, even when the burdens are not there. Now, you don't want your mind to be like that. You want it to be able to stand up straight, every now and then at least. So I can remember what it's like to stand up straight, and how good it feels to stand up straight. So it's an important skill while you're here with the breath that you want to be able to let go of everything else. And then when you work through the breath to the point where the breath stops, okay, you can let go of the breath then. Just be with the awareness in and of itself that remains. There may be an awareness of space, an awareness of consciousness in and of itself. And if you have to hold on to something, then hold on to that for the time being. But it's possible to let go even of those things. And this is the skill that will see you through. This is the reason people suffer as they get sick and suffer as they die, as the mind will latch on to something. And in many cases it's pretty random. It has to do with their past karma, things that suddenly pop up at that moment. And because the mind is weak and feels threatened, it'll just latch on, because it's not used to not latching on to anything. When your awareness can't stay with the body, it's going to grab at anything at all, if it hasn't been trained. But if you learn how to let go, you realize you don't need to hold on to anything. It's not like you're going to fall down anywhere. This is one of the reasons why the Buddha has you practice that skill and remind yourself that when it's just awareness in and of itself, there is no up, there is no down. There's no inside, there's no outside, there's just awareness. Up, down, inside, outside, all those all have to do with the body, physical reality. But when the mind is able to let go of those things, it doesn't need to have those coordinates. It's like going to outer space. Concepts north, south, east, west have no meaning in outer space. They have meaning only in reference to the earth. So when you let go of things, you don't have to be afraid that you're going to fall anywhere. You're right here. And if your good qualities of mind have been developed enough, that will be sufficient. So the meditation is a progressive process of letting go, letting go, so peeling things away, peeling things away. But to do this, on the one hand, requires the heedfulness that motivates the practice, and then the good qualities you develop as a result of that heedfulness, wisdom, purity, compassion, mindfulness, alertness.
These are things that have real solid worth. So that when you think about how little time you have left and how little time we all have left, it's the heedfulness that reminds you these are the things you want to develop. These are the things you want to give most of your time and energy to because they give the greatest rewards. <laughs>